for. Um, first, I want to start to acknowledge that we uh, passed a budget last night. Um, there's a lot of mixed feelings around that process, but I know there was a lot of hard work, and I'm uh, glad that the district is in a position where we can, can move forward with school year next year at funding levels that are adequate. Uh, but I also know that uh, for this community, in particular Roxbury, uh, it has come with, with a lot of hurt and uh, and uh, feelings of uncertainty. Uh, I know there's been a lot of great work done in the last few weeks with the transition to committee to try to make uh, the move of elementary students to UBS as uh, smooth as possible. And I think everyone is feeling very confident that we can, can do that in a way that um, meets the students and families' needs uh, and uh, gives them great educational experience there, but I also know that there is a lot of comfort and uncertainty, um, and I think uh, no one on the board wanted to work with this thing we did. I, I also want to um, acknowledge I had a contentious exchange with a Roxbury resident at the previous meeting. Uh, that in no way is a reflection of the frustrations I have in the Roxbury community or any dismissal. The concerns of the community, uh, I apologize if any of it came across that way. Um, I should not have let the frustration show through. Uh, they were not directed at the concerns expressed. Um, in this having a conversation with, so I just want to make that, that clear. Um, and again, just thank you for all the hard work. Uh, there were a lot of hours put in. I, I know. That everyone feels both relieved that we're not in the position that these districts are in. I think very frustrated with what the state uh, did to to district to put us in this position. Uh, and I think we're all unified in our desire to uh, make sure that the changes that the budget wants to uh, happen in a way that meet our educational goals. Uh, the first order of business is, is public comment. Um, uh, if anyone would like to speak in the room or online, uh, uh, please do so. Again, this is a, a time for the board to uh, listen. Uh, just because we don't respond in real time uh, does not mean that we're not uh, taking the concerns very seriously. Um, and that they are not part of, of our deliberative process and our decision-making process. Um, and also, if, if you don't uh, feel comfortable or, or don't have, have time uh, to speak at public comment, uh, you can always email the board at uh, schoolboard at mpbsbt.org. Uh, uh, so if anyone in the room would like to speak, uh, please do, and then we'll go online. If, and please just step up to the... Am I on the agenda for facilities? Uh, you are not on the agenda, but you're certainly welcome to be uh, to speak at public comment. I think we wanted that. Beyond there. Can I step up to the table? Yeah, of course. Yeah, oh, please do. Uh, first, I want to say a couple things. And um, it may sound, well, first thing I'd like to say is to thank. Um, I don't know, Miss, Mrs., I don't know what your title is, okay, but uh, thank you for your letter. I'm going to put it in a frame and put it on the wall next to my desk. Um, I consider it a badge of honor. Um, now, the things that I want to talk to you about are, and don't laugh because this is serious, Okay. Are you going to put a porta potty in that bus? That's what I want to know. You know, you got vibrations going on. Are you going to give them kidney belts like they like they used to use in motorcycles, or what are you going to do to stop that problem? Okay, enough said on that. Up north, I'm told by a guy I met at the state house when I was there, they're traveling forty some odd miles one way to school. Can you imagine? 80 miles a day for a kid going to school, first, second, third graders. It's ludicrous. 
Secondly, enough said on that subject. My real big worry is, besides that, that they're going to get treated like hicks from the sticks. You're clashing two cultures together, and I don't think it's going to be good on the Roxbury kids. Okay? Enough said about that. Now we'll get down to the heart of the problem. There's a bunch of bunch of problem. I've been trying for two years, talk to him, talk to the other guys about getting the gutter cleaned. And it's filled up and you can see the rot coming down the outside the building if you want to go and look at it. Um, and um, I guess I'm uh, a self-appointed committee of one. Okay. Um, I repair barns for a living, the barn doctor, that's my title. I do heavy timber post and beam work, and I do not want to fix this building again. Okay. Um, thereby, we have a man in town that has a, a man lift that can look at it. Uh, he refuses to do it while you own the building. He's a selectman. They understand they don't agree, but they understand what I'm doing here tonight. I'm here tonight to demand that building back. And I'm here to tell you that Ms. or whatever bone steel was right. Um, I hope you didn't think that I would do um, anything while the school was in session. Okay. I love the kids. Um, I like living across the street from and listen to them talk with their parents when they go home. You know, my kids are in their 20s, okay? Um, I fully intend this summer, if I don't, we don't get the building back, I fully intend this summer to break into this building. And what I will do the first thing when I get in this building is I will go to the phone and call the state police and tell them I'm in the building. I want to be arrested. I want to be taken away from this. I want all the bad publicity I knew we can get. The people of this town already hate you for what you did. We need to have our school back for several reasons. One of which you understand my statement that I want to do a different school there. But the main reason is I don't want to have to fix this building again. I didn't fix it in the first place. Steve Twombly did. And he mixed the metaphors. He used plywood, gussets, instead of heavy timber, I believe where the rafters meet the plate or meet the cross tie, okay? I haven't seen it in a bunch of years. I was there when they did it. I was all over this building when it was renovated in the 80s. Um, I've tried many times to talk to this gentleman here and to talk to the other guys about getting that gutter clean, and it doesn't ever happen. It's still there. So I'm not going to let it sit another winter. Whatever I got to do, I got to do. If I got to go to jail, no problem. Not a problem with me at all. What I fully intend to do is take over the building in the middle of summer sometime and chain you out. We don't want you here. We don't want not, I never wanted anything to do with Mount Player anyway. We wanted U32. Everybody that thrived in this school went to U32 when they couldn't handle it here or Mount Player or, or Northfield, including Ben Pincus. He got in trouble in Northfield and had to go to U32. Nobody ever went to Mount Pillar. We got stuffed into Mount Pillar by the state. Our guys didn't give us any opportunity to go anywhere else because the state didn't give them any opportunity because they probably needed more for the red in Mount Pillar. More people, more towns for the red. Why wouldn't you get enough? Because it's the highest tax town in Central Vermont, probably. My theories alone don't know. Okay, but I never wanted to be with my player. We always wanted to be with U32. We were denied that. And it wasn't just me alone wanting to go to U32. Like I said, every kid that thrived from here that went to another school went to U32 and, and made out great there. But we were not allowed. We were told, I assume they were not lying to us. We were told that we could not go to U32, that we had to go to Montpelier. It's not, it's not a right fit for us, you know, never was and never will be. I don't know what else I can say to you, you know, 
except that I will call the police immediately and let them know that I've taken over the building. We want this building back. Or I want this building back. The selectmen know what I'm doing. They haven't said one way or the other. Okay? I don't think they like what I'm doing. I don't care whether they like it or not. We're in a situation where nobody understands what the hell is going on financially. We're at a tipping point, in my opinion. And we're also at a point where assholes like me have to take charge and do whatever has to be done. Because if we wait for you people to do it, you're too good to be able to do it, too goody shoes, too whatever the deal is. You can't seem to get it done. Neither can the legislature. Look where we are. I mean, it's probably my own... I mean, I believe there's global change. Don't get me wrong. But why the hell should we waste money on global warming or any of that crap when we can put it into education? Talk to the legislature. You don't get nowhere. But I am in the hopes that I had a little bit of success. She come out of committee two to three. Okay? They had my information that you have at the committee. And I talked to them. Uh, the old gentleman says, don't go to jail. The rest of them were very nice and very kind to hear me. Um, I believe that I'm blessed to be in a state where I can walk in to the Education Committee of the Legislature and be heard. You know, I don't think you can do that in a lot of states. I really don't. Um, one more thing. I have to say to you people, uh, and to a lot of people that come here, I don't think they understand what it's like living in the country. It's a whole different ball of wax than living in the city. And for example, they let their dogs run loose. They don't think there's a lease lease in here, lease, lease law. What happens is they chase deer and kill them. I mean, I've seen dogs this tall, little tiny guys chase deer and, and run them down till the deer. I mean, I've seen a dog chewing on a deer, crying like a baby, and I shot the deer. Should have shot the dog. I saved one bullet for the dog. I missed him. Okay. Um, game wardens didn't like it, but they understood what I was doing. Um, If you want to look it up, you'll probably find a bunch of history on me. Nothing seriously criminal, um, but definitely forceful. And I mean what I say. I will take over this school. And a lot of times I maybe say we. Yeah, I got a mouse in my pocket. I don't know what anybody feels here except what they echoed at town meeting or what they hands up at town meeting about wanting to keep a school here. Um, one last thing. Nothing to do with you guys, but to do with this to do with the state. I seriously believe, and, and I've, I've I haven't yet gone through the formal process, but I've asked the uh, Bill Scotts, um, who I know slightly. He got me a meeting once with a legislative council. Anyway, I've asked him. Um, not officially on paper, but I'm going to follow it up to be on a committee. If he's going to do a committee on future school funding, that's what he said on TV. Don't know if he's going to do it or not, but if he's going to do it, I can bring a low income perspective. Um, one last thing I want to say to you, I talked to Ben Pincus and asked him this question. I might ask you the same question, but whatever. I talked to Hooper, my legislator, one of them, and I said to him, pardon me? Oh, okay. I said to him, this is the, this is the uh, problem. You have a budget that needs to be cut. You have two qualified people to do it. One that's rich like you and one that's poor. Which one do you send? You can only send one. They both said to me, you send the poor. Well, what I said to my legislature, that's your problem. 
You got nobody here that's poor. Everybody up there is doing pretty well in their life. We live cutting a budget every day. I had to give up my phone, which I lost, which is just as well. I got my other one coming in, my barn doctor fund coming in. But I lost my phone because I didn't have enough money to pay for my mortgage, not my mortgage, my taxes and my power bill. And I couldn't pay the phone bill. So they took the phone away. And because my ex owed a lot of money on the phone, it was her grandmother's phone. They won't renew it, but that's okay. I'm going back to my barn doctor phone because I have a business and it's better that I have the business phone, but I've had that one for many years because it was what we had. It was her grandmother's phone. So that'll tell you that I do know how to make choices to survive with no money. And that's what needs to be done here, whether you realize it or not. Maybe not. I don't know. We've had this problem before where budgets got voted down. So the question is, is that just a once in a while thing? Or are we cycling up to where we're at the taxing limit of the public in this state? And that's what I believe. I believe we're getting near the taxing limit and that's why they're moaning and groaning and crying. Well, all those people who did all the crying over the school budget closing and school closing, none of them stepped up to do anything. My proposal is junk compared to the brains of a lot of you people, but nobody stepped up to do anything, any other kind of proposal to try and keep school going here. It's more than just a school, last thing for sure. It's more than just a school, it's a town. And you're ripping apart a town. I realize it's not your fault. I realize you're trying to do the best you can, but you can't blame us for hating you because of it. We lost our school. We lost everything, you know, and now we don't know what's going to happen with the building, whether it's going to rot or get further in trouble. So I'm here to bitch and moan about it. And uh, one last thing I would like, what you write down that I'm saying, I would love a copy of that because I wanted to be on the agenda. Okay. And uh, write it as colloquially as you like, you know, not a problem. Done. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Anything you want to say to me? Thank you. Yeah, just thank you. Now we're, we're listening. Well, you can beat up on me more than that. I can take it. Oh, no, we appreciate appreciate the input. Thank you. Nothing? No comments from anybody? No comments? Yeah, I got a comment. You're using up everybody's time. Okay. Done. Simple. Anyway. Well, I just, uh, oh my God, there's a microphone. You come to Roxbury, you get a microphone. Unbelievable. Um, no, I just wanted to, I just wanted to say that, uh, I hope you're, you're satisfied. I hope, uh, the, the board chair and the superintendent after all their scheming and, and, um, misinformation have been successful in stealing our school driving a stake through the heart of it. I live next door. We have the greenhouse across the road. We were talking today or yesterday with a young couple, and we just realized how quiet it's going to be in the village now. It's going to be, I mean, the heart is gone, will be gone. And I just hope that you five, actually only a couple of them are here, that voted for closing our school are really proud of yourselves. This didn't have to happen. You refused to put a budget out there that included Roxbury for 1.89%. I'm very certain that people in Montpelier would have covered it. But you had your motives. Your motives were to infill your student needs in UES. Like somebody pointed out to me the other day, it wasn't long ago you took our fourth and fifth grades, I mean, fifth and sixth graders away. So that reduced our numbers. So this has been a long, long time process for you folks. And I hope you're proud of yourselves. I really do. Well, 
Anyone else? Anyone online? And there's nobody from the public online. No, there's nobody online. All right. Um, thank you all. Uh, the next item is the consent agenda. Uh, the consent agenda is uh, where we approve. Oh, wait. N Nancy Bruce raised oh. her hand. I'm sorry. She just raised her hand. Nancy? Sorry. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I want to uh, acknowledge the the incredible amount of motion and challenge and difficulty and loss and grief and frustration and anger and um, I want to thank all of you for your hard, hard work. Um, I'm sure you, you know, no one anticipated this, this situation that many, many districts and towns are facing. So, um, I know I've been a, a, a critic, um, hopefully a uh, informative one, but but thank you all for the, the, this extraordinary time and all that you had to work with and deal with under the time schedule that you had. And regardless of how I feel about the decisions. I really just want to acknowledge all of you and thank you for what you've done and are doing in the best interest of the voters. Um, I know it's really hard. I'm, I'm still sort of kind of processing the, the previous comments, but I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. I know you have a long agenda. Um, I'll just end by saying really, really thank you for your public service in such a really, really hard time. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. We appreciate it. Who was that? Was Nancy Bruce. And uh, that's it. Um, so the next order of business is the consent agenda. Uh, this is where we uh, approve uh, things that are kind of pro forma that don't need discussion, like uh, minutes of former meetings, uh, teacher contracts, et cetera. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move we approve the consent agenda. Do I have a second? Uh, any discussion or questions about the consent agenda? Tim? The authorization for Chair to sign warrants. Can you speak to that just a minute? Is, it, is there like a up to a certain amount, or is there a is that general? Or how? that's just explain that. That's um, basically what we need for payroll, and the chair or vice chair needs to sign it every is it week or two weeks well you, you approve them in the consent agenda and then once they're approved the yeah the, the board of vice chair signs them and so that it's for, it's for warrants approved mm -hmm. by yeah the board. Mm -hmm. yeah right. and it it allows it's uh, pro forma you'll see it on the yeah. you'll see it on the um consent agenda every time this year yeah. around this time got it thank you uh any other questions I wonder if Kristen. anybody from the uh, the finance committee would just be willing to give like a brief. Oh, thank you. We forgot to put that on the agenda. Did you? Oh, did you guys meet the? Yeah, we oh, just okay. forgot to put the the kind of approved the third quarter report. Oh. Yeah, well, it's in the consent agenda. I oh, didn't, is it? it okay. is. Yeah, but I didn't. If the, anybody from the finance committee is willing to just give a update. Jake is the ranking member. Do you want to give an update of the third quarter report that you all just heard? Any like you know 
major takeaways, things that you think we should be aware of? Yeah. Um, if Tim is allowed, he can yeah, jump chime in, of in. course. <laughs> um, I mean, the major takeaways to me that were, uh, we were going over with Christina, um, the status of the different budget line items through the third quarter. And, um, you know, there are normal variances um, that had explanations, but overall, um, you know, things were on track. Um, there's a few unfilled positions that, um, you know, we're trying to fill and a couple that we may not try to fill this fiscal year. Um, and then recovering some money from FEMA um, has been logistically challenging, but we expect it to happen eventually related to the flood damage. Um, and Tim, what else did you the recoveries from insurance seem to be going well, the non FEMA piece? Um, the insurance seems to be coming in uh, well and as expected, is, is I think a takeaway. And um, spoke a little bit about the sort of history of the capital fund and um, what the transfer has been, and um, looked at sort of a general trend um, to increase modestly uh, in the next couple of years, by like 10,000 years, I think the running assumption. Um, my first one is, Thank you. but seemed generally on track and didn't seem to be any major surprises. Thanks, Laura. Second time Tim's microphone has kind of squeaked, so I don't know if there's a bug in it or not, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, any more questions on the consent agenda? Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, great. Now we are on to the facilities master plan. And if people remember um, what seems like a few years ago now, but I think it was just last fall, uh, we hired Truex uh, in the wake of uh, Particularly the flooding damage, I think, was was kind of the, the big motivation for it to do a facilities examination um, and put together a report um, kind of detailing the state of our facilities and some possible options for um, uh, for the future. So, uh, yes, so please, please come up. And, um, and also, I, I, I read the executive summary in detail and skimmed through the report. It's, it's an excellent piece of work. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And guys, just so you know, I'm going to share it online. You share, you can share it for the people here, but I'll, oh. I'll be get. I got it for the Zoom yeah, screen. Fine. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. I can follow you. So I can introduce. If you haven't met already, we have David, Cam, and Kevin. Not in that order. Kevin, David, Cam, in order. Looking at them. <laughs> Kevin is from Engineering Adventures and did a lot of the climatology and engineering kind of piece in this report. And Dave and Cam are from Truex Collins, the architectural piece. Is there any way to not dim or turn, like, is, there, is it all on or all off? Just turn the lights. I mean, we've got to turn on natural lights. Yeah, could, could we try turning some of the lights? Oh, the architects oh. need to be perfect. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you need the drama. You, 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 <laughs> You're lucky we didn't rearrange the furniture because <laughs> that's been known to happen too. Um, okay. Well, thank you all. And um, we're, uh, we're going to give a very high level overview of the master plan, kind of a, an executive summary of the executive summary. Um, and then we'll leave time for questions at the end. Uh, just a brief introduction. Um, Truex Collins is an architecture and interior design firm in, Bur in Burlington. Uh, we were founded in 1968. I like to say I started when I was seven. Um, we have a staff of 38. And Cam and I work a lot on the uh, K through 12 schools. We do schools in um, all over Vermont. I mean, we even do some international schools, which uh, we're hoping to get Libby to help us on. I've, I've volunteered my time yeah, right. to be an educational consultant. As your Uzbek. Yeah. <laughs> Not languages. It's cool. And, and joining us is um, Kevin Warden from Engineering Ventures. You want to tell us a little bit about? Sure. Yeah, we're based in Burlington. We've worked with 
David and Cam and Trix uh, for the past 30 years that we've been around and um, certainly specialize in uh, K through 12, but also projects that um, in the past several years, unfortunately, have had climate resiliency issues. This is one that you're all familiar with in Waterbury. And um, here after Irene, we um, worked with the state to evaluate the site, remove 22 buildings, keep keep uh, the state at the location and flood proof the historic buildings and add a new building. And uh, fortunately it weathered very well in July. Um, many other buildings around the state and uh, projects like uh, the target in West Leb that was done in the floodplain. So a lot of experience around that. We do civil and structural engineering. So I just wanted to give a little overview of the um, of our presentation. Um, we're going to, as I said, do a, an executive summary of the executive summary, and then we're going to talk about some of the planning options that we investigated. Um, the the, there's four themes, four lenses that we looked at. Um, the first, of course, is environmental resilience, which uh, comes as no surprise. This is a, a picture of the July flood uh, and the high school. And um, you'll see how uh, the building was like an island. I think it came within, was it eight inches of the floor? Yeah, um, the first floor. And as everybody knows, the lower level was completely flooded. Um, Thankfully, this happened in July, and you were able to get ready um, in time for school. But imagine if it happened during the school year. Um, and you'll and I, it's interesting to note that um, Memorial Drive is not flooded. Um, it's very consistent with the flood maps. Turn out to be incredibly accurate. Um, the the second is enrollment trends because. You know that's always the foundational piece of a master plan. Are you growing? Um, are you are, are enrollment is enrollment flat? Um, and then of course, aging facilities. Um, you know the stock of schools in Vermont is quite old, and Montpelier is no different. Um, and the buildings haven't been renewed; they've been maintained, but they haven't had a real renewal in quite a long time. Um, so that's a factor. And then, you know, the evolving pedagogy, the, the way education is delivered has changed over the years. Um, the buildings haven't. And so what we're looking for is, are there any buildings that are really out of alignment with the way education is delivered? Um, and so we'll talk about that as well. So, this is just a, a schedule showing what we've been up to. Uh, and we uh, mercifully are right on schedule here at the beginning of May with a board presentation after delivery of the final report. Uh, so I'm happy to report that this project is on time and on budget. Uh, as the project manager, that's yeah. important to me. Of course, we've modified the schedule to make it accurate. So, so Cam, can yeah. that's not true. no, no. <laughs> Um, but what I want to point out is that, um, we did, uh, in, in November, we had a community workshop where we talked about the context, what were all the factors, these themes we we're looking at, what, what, and got community input. And then we did a visioning workshop with a group, uh, to talk about what are, should, should be the guiding principles of the master plan. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so, so there was a quite a bit of information gathering that we visited all the schools um, and quite a bit of learning as well, because, you know, the, the, um, the flood regulations in Montpelier are new. And so we were learning about them and we're here to talk to you about how they impact future planning in the district. So first lens enrollment projections. Um, these are the last, um, 10 years going back to 2015 and you could see um, it's pretty flat. Um, there was a, a little bit of a rise around 2020 and then it dipped back down. So um, this is, like I said, a very foundational document to planning. And so one of our recommendations is that 
um, you have enrollment projections uh, done, a study done that tries to look at the next 10 years. And some, some districts do that themselves, some hire outside consultants. It's a little bit of a, a, a dark art in terms of um, how, you know, how it's done and, and, but it's important because um, it, it's the basis for so much of the planning. So that's, that's one of our um, recommendations. And, and that's the way the report is organized. For those who've read it, we have findings and recommendations, and we're going to follow that same format for this presentation. So um, the facilities uh, conditions generally, uh, you know, these facilities were built. The first structure was built in 1854. Uh, the last structure was built in 1957. Um, so that's a little on the older side uh, in general, uh, and it's an interesting assortment of buildings. Um, the chart on the right is a kind of a snapshot uh, comparison matrix. And we, we do, we use these like heat maps so that we can see kind of how the buildings stack up against each other. Uh, and it's a pretty simple metric. Um, either the, if it's red, it's that space either doesn't exist or there's some kind of, uh, of failure. Uh, if it's yellow, it exists, but it's either undersized or it needs work. And if it's, if it's green, it exists and it's in good condition. Um, so I think it, it more or less speaks for itself and there's a, you know, you could quibble a little bit. I think some people could have a slightly different opinion about certain things, but generally we've, we feel pretty good about these assessments. I'll take the next one. Yeah. Why don't we save them to the end and then let the guys. The, um, we wanted to just touch brief briefly on the status of the PCB testing, um, our understanding is that Union and uh, Main Street have been tested. And um, and to be clear, the testing is air testing. Uh, what the state is testing is, is are there PCBs in the air above an actionable level? Um, they're not testing material testing. If they do find um, that they are actionable levels, then they start testing materials to figure out where it is. And when they do start, if you do find um, PCBs in materials, then you, you don't have the luxury of waiting um, until you do a project. You have to remediate it um, in a timely fashion and file it with the the uh, EPA. The, um, the high school is, I, I believe it's underway. The testing's underway. Um, and, you know, basically PCBs are were used in a, a, a series of products, mostly in caulk, to keep it uh, plastic and pliable, but unfortunately it leaches out of the caulk and into nearby materials such as block or brick, sometimes into, even into soil. Um, sometimes we find it in epoxy uh, materials. Um, and so um, if, if, if Montpelier High School comes back and it's, there's no, no issues, it doesn't mean you don't have PCBs in your buildings, it just means they're not in the air. So when you start to do a major project, like I know the windows at Main Street Middle School and Union Elementary School need to be replaced, that's a, a we see that quite often is because the caulk around the windows um, might have had PCBs in it, leaches into nearby materials. Could be an issue, we don't know. But I just want to say that when you um, – when you pass the state test in terms of it's really just air, it's not materials. It's not in, it's not bulk, what they call bulk testing. So I just wanted to, we just wanted to make sure that was clear. So um, we want to talk about uh, recommendations for, for budgeting for facilities. Um, we've gotten some information from the state uh, as they've been exploring uh, a, a construction aid program, um, they have uh, unearthed recommendations from the American uh, Physical Plant Administrators 
group, that's the Association of Physical Plant Administrators, which actually focuses on educational facilities. And their recommendations are, are actually kind of similar to the ones you get when you buy a home. You know, you buy a home and they tell you, you should plan on spending about 2% of the purchase price every year on maintenance. And of course, we, I'm, I'm my own custodian. So the numbers that they recommend is a 1% of the current replacement value for maintenance and operations. That's custodians, salaries, cleaning materials, kind of just keeping the place uh, uh, maintained in terms of custodial work. They recommend 2% of current replacement value being budgeted annually for replacement of uh, equipment and repairs uh, in kind as you're, you know, as you're moving along, you sometimes need to replace a kitchen hood or a piece of equipment in the, in a classroom. Um, and then they recommend that if you're going to do capital renewal, which is you're going to do a big construction project, uh, and you're going to modernize the building that you would budget out 4% of current replacement value. And these numbers are, are far in excess of what people have historically been budgeting. And I'll acknowledge that. And it's not unique to this district. It's, um, but here's the, here's a chart, which shows what some of the numbers are and they're, they're, they're big numbers and they're, they're, they're scary. Um, I would point out that, you know, that the line where it says annual recommended maintenance budget of 3%, um, that's kind of the line that would be, you know, you're, you're keeping your buildings completely up to date and that's, managing all the issues. That's, this line, right that's this line right here. Yeah. And I would point out that, that, that the numbers that you're, uh, that you are uh, budgeting, those were good numbers in 2019. Um, and, and it's, and, it, and, it, and it's He's not, not trying to be funny. Jim. Uh, no, it's, <laughs> it's, it's actually meant, oh, yeah. well, it's meant to be a comforting statement in some ways, although it's uncomfortable because the cost of construction has, has ballooned. It's just mushroomed over the last four years since COVID. And so the current replacement value and associated cost of repairs to fix things or replace things has also gone up. So it's just it's going up faster than we than we can keep pace. Um, and and I you know I think two of the recommendations. One is um, you're not going to be able to budget your way out of your facility issues. You're not going to be able to fund them in your capital budget because it's just too much money. So you're going to have to consider other ways of funding large capital renewal projects like the windows you know, I know are an issue in both middle, the Main Street Middle School and Union, Union, Union Elementary School. And that's probably, I don't know, we is Andrew here, was it like 4 million for both? Well, getting pretty close. Getting yeah. Close to 300 windows, over 300 so, um, so that's a reality. Um, the other piece is that um, I, w I was on the task force that helped write the recommendations for uh, school construction program, and they are using this APPA guidelines. Uh, they, they, the feeling is that to be eligible for school construction aid, that districts have to demonstrate they're on a path towards sustainable funding of their capital budget. And they're currently, this is the only benchmark that has been discussed. So, so the other recommendation is to, you know, and I, I know we're, we're saying this in the face of this whole budget strife, but, um, you know, con to consider budgeting more or getting on a pathway uh, to, to budget more to take care of your buildings because, um, you know, it's, it's based on these recommendations and also based on um, that this is likely going to be included in a school construction aid um, program. And um, it's a, it's a, it's just a heads up. So this is a, another heat map just showing some of the um, features of the building spaces. When we talk about educational alignment, um, the, you'll see that, um, you know, some red by the auditoriums. Um, Main Street Middle School, for example, doesn't have one. I would say the um, 
in general, the buildings are um, reasonably aligned with the educational uh, program they're trying to deliver it with the exception. And this is a big exception of the, the main street middle school. Um, a middle school concept is based on teaming and the ideal middle school has spaces that build the, the sense of team and build a sense of community with the team. Usually those classrooms. So if you have four, sixth grade classrooms, they're together, there might be a common room. Um, the mainstream middle school being a high school designed in 1907 doesn't have those kind of spaces, doesn't allow those kinds of spaces to create it. Um, it's fighting the, 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 the alignment between the concept of a middle school and that building is, is not there. Um, and along with that, a lot of the spaces are too small. The art rooms are too small. The library's too small. And, and as we know, there's no, there's no auditorium, there's no performing, performing art space at all. So of your portfolio of buildings, we would say that one is the, um, in terms of that lens of educational alignment is the least aligned. So one of the recommendations is as you look long-term is um, considering the replacement or major renovation of the middle school. Um, and we'll talk about that more when we get to the planning options. So this exhibit shows the schools here in the district and uh, an overlay of the FEMA floodplain information. And of course, July is uh, all too uh, evident in our recollection here in memory um, and shows the real significance of flooding. Um, other areas have tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes. In Vermont, we do get flooding. And as David said, it's pretty uh, accurate to the maps because it's based on elevation. And um, you know, not only are construction costs rising, but floodwaters are rising. Um, we're seeing more intensity of rain events longer uh, and more frequency of flooding beyond what was historically predicted. Um, the blue on these plans is the 100 year flood or theoretically could happen a 1% chance every year. We've had that now two times in the last 12 years. Uh, and the orange is the 500 or 2 or 0.2% chance of flooding. Um, and you can see that in both of the Montpelier images, the Roxbury image doesn't actually have mapping of the 500 uh, year. It's just FEMA doesn't include that, but I would expect that we're, we're in it. Um, all three schools in Montpelier uh, are touched uh, by at least the 500 year flood. Um, and of course, as we've seen in the photographs, the high school uh, is completely surrounded by it. The flooding that we had in July at eight inches below the first floor is just about the 100 year flood. Um, I have, speaking of things changing, I have a couple other things are changing. One is the Montpelier flood regs. When I wrote this report, it had changed three times since July. Uh, and I decided before coming down today, I better check it again. <laughs> and it's changed three times again in the last couple of months. Um, oh I don't think anything major or significant, but one important thing to note that's included in the regulations is a designation of critical facilities and critical facilities uh, are basically um, def defined as um, structures that, if destroyed or damaged, have the potential to cause disruption of vital socioeconomic activity. Critical facilities include government built facilities, category two and four buildings. And based on all three of those determinations or designations, public schools fit into critical facilities. Um, and at least in Montpelier, the requirements are to flood proof those facilities to the 500 year flood elevation plus two feet. And we can go over what that means in more detail. Uh, if you're just continuing to use the building, there are no requirements to flood proof. But if you are making substantial improvements, uh, which is improving 
uh, more than 50% of the market value of that building, you are required to bring it up to current standards. Or more importantly, which is kind of the, the ticking clock here, is if you continue to experience what's called substantial damage, um, and that is cumulative. So the costs incurred to repair, um, and these are the total costs, even though they're funded by FEMA in many cases, the cost to repair from past flood damage starts to accumulate. And if that reaches 50% of the market value, um, presumably the, the uh, requirement is to flood proof the building. And we, we can get a little more into what that would mean a little later on. And I just want to point out that in the previous slides, we were talking about the current replacement value when we were talking about budgeting. That's the cost of if you had to go out and rebuild the school from scratch, this, um, this flood, um, national flood program, uh, insurance program uses market value. So it's very, very different. And we don't know what the market value is. Um, and that's something in our recommendations is that, um, at some point the district will need to get appraisals on all the, the properties to understand what that is, because, you know, as you're doing projects, you, you could very well trigger um, having to comply with the FEMA regulations by going over the 50% mark based on the market value. So um, we wanted to talk specifically, you know, there are parts of each building that touch the 500 year floodplain, the basement of Union Elementary School uh, the cafeteria and kitchen of the middle school, and of course, the entire first floor of the high school. Um, and you can see, you can see this uh, exhibit here. Um, and as we were talking about, if you look along the, um, I think I can point use this pointer. This is Memorial Drive. Is not in the 500 year. Um, not in the 100 year. Not in the 100 year, sorry. A little bit in the five, but not in the 100. And so, um, and you could see that in, in that photo that we showed that Memorial Drive was um, dry. Um, and it pretty much looked like this. This mapping was, was pretty accurate. So one of the things we want to talk about is what to do about the high school. And that's kind of the big the big issue, right? And we'll talk. We'll talk about that um, very soon. But what we're recommending is considering building a new high school on the current site, but at a higher elevation. Um, and we're going to talk about what it would mean to try and dry flood proof the building, um, and why we don't think that's a great idea. Um, but we'll get that there in the middle in a minute. So before we talk about the um, design options, we wanted to just briefly touch on the guiding principles. Um, and there were a couple that were um, were very helpful in terms of our investigation. One was this walkable buildings that are integrated with the community that came through loud and clear. People love that the kids could walk to school, that they could, um, that it was integrated into the community. Uh, the idea of a, a site that was remote that had to be, you had to bus to was, was very, um, was not supported. And, and also the idea that the, you would, you could separate, the um, the playing fields from the academic spaces, and that you could just bus kids between those. Um, I don't know if that made it into the guiding principles, but I know that was very much like talking with administration and how the, how a future facility could function was um, was sort of a non-starter. So, Cam, I'll let you talk about this map. Yeah. So what what we're looking at here is the 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 white amoeba shape is everywhere in Montpelier where there is development. Um, 
either housing or or uh, other and if you if it's green on this map it's a pretty steep slope because they've pretty much built out the town um there may be a little bit of land near national life that's probably unattainable and possibly Sabin's pasture which is um you know uh, considered unavailable generally um <laughs> So, and the, and the circle is a one mile radius from city center. Um, so what we're trying to do is look at where are there sites in town that you can walk to from the downtown core. And the high school site is kind of uh, to the east of the center right there. So it's, it's definitely walkable for most of the town to stay in that on that site. So we kind of focused there when, after we determined that it was it was feasible to rebuild on that site. So Kevin, maybe you could help us talk a little bit. This is a project you did. This is a, a dry flood proofing project, uh, the, a target in Hanover West or Lebanon. Le West Lebanon. Yeah, right over the bridge. And what are we looking at, Kevin? So you know, there's two ways to flood proof a commercial building or a non-residential building. One is certainly the most foolproof way is to raise the building. And um, that's probably what we'll talk about a little more later. And that's the um, measure that was employed at Waterbury uh, for the state office complex. Another, if that's just not feasible, is to dry flood proof. And um, that's basically keeping the water out. And um, that's what you're seeing here. The um, this is a large shopping plaza in West Lebanon, and the floor is about four feet below the floodplain elevation. It's right near um, where the um, Mascoma and Connecticut River um, join in. And during Irene, sure enough, there was 18 inches of water in this building. Um, and this solution is basically. Um, reinforcing the entire perimeter of the walls. You know, the backside of shopping centers have big CMU walls and it's reinforcing all those to withstand the pressure of water. And then all these openings have this floodgate installed. Um, and, you know, it's tested, it's designed to work, but the challenge is if there's any one point of failure during a flooding event, water will find its way in everywhere to the building. So that's that's the shortcoming of these solutions. It, it, they did mo mobilize during July. They put the panels out. Uh, fortunately, in this location, for them, the water didn't rise up to actually employ them. But In the case of the high school, you know, I think it's worth noting that even if you dry flood proof the building, which we think is prob pro probably prohibitively expensive, uh, given the how old the building is now and the work that it needs even if you did dry flood proof the building and even if all the dry flood proofing was successful and kept all the water out if the if there was a flash flooding event during the school day you'd have 400 students in the building and where do they go do they go up on the roof do you get them out do you get them in rowboats um you we don't do have kayaks you don't yeah <laughs> you don't but people are you know dissuaded from kayaking in flood waters um so to, to us, this seems like, uh, you know, not necessarily the most prudent way forward. Um, I'll, I guess I'll leave it at that. And the, one, the other thing I would add to that is, um, I don't think I touched on this in my introduction of flooding, but right now, um, you know, I mentioned that Montpelier, for example, would like critical facilities to be raised to the 500 year plus two feet. FEMA is reviewing all their flood maps and actually looking at updating the designation so that the 100 year actually rises to the elevation of the 500 just based on the increased intensity. So um, as we continue to have more um you know, uh, concentrated weather events, we'll be seeing those maps change over time. So, so one one of the ideas that arose um, as a result of all of this information that we gathered and learning was the idea of um, raising a section of the site along Memorial Drive 
creating an access point from Memorial Drive and Bailey and um, and then keeping the parking and the playing fields low, which is a, a very similar strategy um, in regards to Waterbury. And if you remember the, the photo that we saw, the parking lots were completely flooded. The building was fine. Um, we can get two feet above the 500 year floodplain on this side of the site. Um, and you can see dashed in gray here or, or shaded the uh, existing high school. So one of the uh, features of this approach is that you could do this work, you know, it would be designed in a way, this is just a very early concept, but it would be designed in a way such that the high school could remain functional you could do this work and then um, move the kids to a new facility and take down the high school. One of the things about the flood proofing that we just showed was that, you know, it could take, it would take far longer than a summer to dry flood proof the building um, cost millions of dollars. And you'd have to find a place for all the kids to, and teachers to go while you did that work. Um, you know, it, we haven't done a facility evaluation of the building, but um, the last time it had major work done was in, I think, 91 was the last um, major addition. And sometimes we use the analogy of an old car. Um, you know, you have an old car, it gets you to work, and then it starts not to become reliable. Maybe the air conditioning doesn't work anymore. Maybe it never had air conditioning. Um, and at a certain point, you know, it needs a major renewal, and you start to ask yourself, is it really, is this, is this the best idea? Is this the most prudent use of um, your money to, to invest in an old facility that was built in 57 and hasn't really been updated since 91 um, and has all these issues uh, related to the floodplain? So um, we, we offer this for your consideration. We should, we should note that also this site does have room. You could, in stages, also do a middle school addition in the future um, because there happens to be enough room uh, on this site for those for both of those schools to move to. Um, and I think, you know, there's quite a bit of athletic field usage anyway from the middle school, and it's in that walkable zone. So it kind of ticks those boxes as well. Um, so it's, it's for, it's just for consideration. Yeah, I, I would add, I'm not sure uh, what architects were thinking in the fifties and sixties, but I've seen tons of schools that are turned at 45 degrees to the street and plopped right in the middle of the parcel, which makes planning around them, uh, inefficient. I, I worked with, um, Andrew quite a bit trying to find places for the track and other fields and, and this site, um, there's just kind of a lot of less efficient spaces. So you can see that organizing the school buildings right along Memorial does kind of reorganize and create a site that's, that's more efficient as well. Finally, we wanted to conclude um, the planning options with a, just a brief discussion of a merger with Washington Central because that has been, um, you know, something that's been discussed over the years. And we just want, so we did some quick analysis. Um, and the current capacity of um, classroom capacity, and this is a, a, you can see the asterisks and the double asterisks. Um, at U32, it assumes every classroom is being used as a classroom with an occupancy of 30 square feet per student with no cap per class size. Um, we all know that school districts have guidelines for class sizes. Um, so, you know, in some cases when there was a large classroom, it could have 32 kids in it or something like that. So this is a very mathematical calculation and it assumes all the classrooms are being used as classrooms. We all know that, you know, special ed and other support services often take over classrooms for other uses. Um, but based on, on um, that simple capacity calculation, uh, it does appear 
that there is sufficient space to accommodate the high school students, but not the middle school students. Um, and of course we have different grade configurations as to what is middle school between the two uh, districts. So, you know, it's obviously complicated, but we wanted to just address that in the report because um, we, we know somebody's going to ask, well, why don't we just move the kids um, up to U32? And the answer is it's, it's not that simple. So just to summarize and wrap up, um, these are some of the recommendations that we talked about. Um, commissioning an enrollment projection study, um, consider funding options for substantial facility projects, such as bonding, um, consider increasing capital budget consistent with APPA recommendations, um, getting the Montpelier facilities appraised, um, and then beginning planning for both short-term and long-term um, adaptation to the to the flood situation. One would be, what do you need to do in the short term? And then long-term, what's the best uh, long-term strategy, um, in, especially in regards to the, the high school? Um, and, and I think, you know, there's an opportunity, as we showed, there is room for the middle school to, um, you know, in a very long-term plan, consider replacement of the middle school. So at this point, uh, that concludes our presentation. We're happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Uh, very excellent presentation, a lot of good information. Uh, question, Brett? Um, are you saying that removal of the windows at Union and MSMS could shake out some PPC, PCBs that would change the values in the air that, and that that would happen after potential testing? Um, I don't, I don't know that I can answer whether that would create, put PCBs in the air, but when you go to do the window projects, you will need to test the materials in and around the windows, including the caulk and any block or brick that's near it and the soil. And if you, um, if, if they find that, then the removal of those uh, materials and the windows becomes a, a hazmat project. So just like an asbestos project, you have to like plastic it off. You have to do negative pressure. They wear those white suits. They come in. It's a special contractor. It's not your regular contractor. So, but I don't believe, and because of that, um, it would not become airborne because they would have it all environmentally controlled. I have three more if that's all right. Yeah, go for it. Um, the drawing of the fields in the floodplain, the district over the last two or three years has had a lot of interest in especially upgrading our track facilities and the community has pushed back. How could you ever do something in a floodplain. Can you talk a little bit about what happens to a well-constructed field and or track facility when it floods? Yeah, very good question. Um, and one that uh, I think requires a little more research, honestly. Um, athletic facilities, we see in designed and installed in a, in a huge range of conditions and qualities, um, anywhere from artificial turf with under drains and e-layers and certain materials all the way down to have it perform at the highest level to, you know, basically, um, kind of, you know, improve farm fields. And, um, I think that final design of fields in the floodplain should take that into account. And I think you can certainly have a track. It can be a rubberized track. Um, you just have to know that it's going to be certain cleaning required. Things that uh, would silt in. Uh, for example, I'll give you an example. Uh, when we did the Waterbury project, 
Um, you had the historic buildings, we had uh, the new building, the parking, and beyond that was farm fields. And the state really pushed to have innovative stormwater treatment to treat all of the water. And those would have been out in the farm fields. And we do those, we do gravel wetlands, we do um, bioretention areas, but knowing that they would be exposed to siltation regularly, we proposed a much simpler solution, um, mm -hmm. just grass swales. So I don't know that I would propose athletic fields with um, very expensive artificial turf systems. Uh, I don't know that I would propose under drains that help dewater fields, but that could be silted in. Um, so I think that would have to be considered. For sure. Approach might not be the most expensive approach. Exactly. Yeah. You you might save some money on your fields, but know that they're not going to be the highest performing be fields. Performing. Yeah, it's a performance issue. And as you saw this July this summer, there's going to be some maintenance required after the flooding. The next question is the footprint of the high school and the middle school. Did you envision those being multi-story buildings? Yes. How many stories? I believe there were two. Two stories, yeah. Could, do, then, could go three, but not necessarily. two could do it. Yeah. Good to know. And then what is the practical reason for getting the buildings appraised as they currently <clears throat> So um, the trigger is when you do 50% or more of um, the appraised value or the market value. So and yeah, and it's cumulative. So it's it includes the money that was spent on the high school um, this past summer. And it doesn't matter, as, as Kevin was saying, whether you paid for it or FEMA paid for it, insurance paid for it. So at a point, you'll hit a trigger and then you'll have to, um, according to the regulations, come uh, drive flood proof the building. And, um, or have, uh, is it dry flood proof? Yeah. So, so you'd want to kind of know where you stand with, and, you know, with, with this issue. I think it jumped, you know, this jumped out at me, the, the market value piece jumped out at me because, you know, we were working with the Danville school and they were facing some pretty, um, heavy renovation needs you know, to the tune of 30 or $40 million. And the current replacement value for that building was probably in the neighborhood of 45 or $50 million, what it would have cost to rebuild new today. <clears throat> but the property had only been appraised for 4 million. And it's because it's a unique occupancy type schools. And, you know, the, the market value for a school building that's 70 years old or more is somewhat less than you would than it would cost substantially less often than it would cost to replace the facility so we don't know what the market value is because it's it changes all the time and there are all kinds of different factors and it is a nice parcel to be honest it's also in the floodplain so it's going to have limited use and it's going to be highly regulated so the market value piece we don't know is it 5 million is it 10 million is it less is it more a commercial appraiser should find that out so that you know how much money you can spend on projects before this gets triggered, because you could get pretty far down the planning route uh, and, you know, windows and a roof might be more, might be enough to trigger. I, I, we don't know. And I'm not trying to claim that it is. It's just that's a key piece for, the, for you all to have moving forward. So we might need it for appraisal maybe before the windows project or different buildings. Different buildings yeah. but this is my question. Does it have to be from a flood? Like, does it have to be repaired from a flood or is this just any discretionary repair or improvement we choose to make? Does that, is that what's accumulated in this? It's, it's any improvements in the facility what? are counted against what's called substantial improvement um, of 50%. And keep in mind, the idea is the federal government through this regulation is trying to dissuade owners from adding value to properties in the floodplain without also mitigating for the flood damage. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I thought you were just No, so there, there are two specific categories in the Montpelier regulations. One is that substantial improvement which is when you intend to make improvements in addition and upgrade the windows, 
re-roof. The other is substantial damage. And that is the same threshold, 50% of market value. And it's money that you didn't want to spend. It's money like you had to spend this summer to repair damage from floods. Okay. And that counts even for for work that might be seen as just kind of maintenance, but obviously you need to yeah, you replace a roof because the roof is leaking and the roof is done. That seems like kind of common maintenance, even though it can be very expensive, as opposed to we're going to have a new wing or we're going to you know retrofit it so it's it's better. I think it's a great question. I don't have the exact answer to that yet. It is substantial improvement. So um, I would, I think it would require a little more uh, review to see if something that's clearly a maintenance repair um, would fit under improvement or not. I, I think generally it is considered, but I think it needs further review to clarify that and something I can look into. Kevin, when's that clock start ticking? So you this... can't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm hoping it's silent right now, but <laughs> I don't have the full uh, definition here. But there's some some I have an abbreviated one and a um, couple things. Substantial improvement in my in abbreviated note includes improvement and repair costs. So I'd want to look into that in the full text. Substantial damage um, is repair from flooding, et cetera. And repetitive loss is flood related damage two times within 10 years. So I think that the, you're, you know, the, 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 so the clock is ticking since July. Right. And if there was more flooding and damage within the next 10 years, it would be cumulative. I think after 10 years, maybe the, the clock resets yes. for that, uh, for that damage. I think that we've had a lot of discussion who regulates this. We could spend a lot of time talking about floods but and flood regulations, but it's it's regulations that come down from the federal government through the National Flood Insurance Program. It's regulated by municipalities who are forced to regulate it if they wish to have insurance uh, benefits for their entire community. So it, it's really the, um, the, the zoning and floodplain manager in Montpelier that would regulate this. And I think... The substantial damage one in terms of who's tracking that is a good question. The um, substantial improvement is if you go and get a building permit to do repair or expansion, that would certainly trigger someone Which we tracking have to do, that. yeah. Yeah. Probably a good thing would be for, even if someone else is tracking it for you also to track it so that you think you, so that you know where you think you are. Yep. I'm sure Andrew is doing that right now. Yeah. Nice spreadsheet <laughs> with Christina. Right. Uh, it, it's not, it's, it's been around, uh, the substantial improvement. I had not seen the substantial damage before. I don't know if that is new in FEMA and then worked its way into the Montpelier regulations. Uh, but the substantial damage is been around. I think it's not always enforced and regulated, but I think certainly in communities that receive repeated flood damage, it's going to be more and more, um, regulated that target project uh unfortunately the owner that bought the building didn't do their due diligence and realized that it was in the floodplain and then needed to work very carefully with the city um to address the flood mitigation um because it was four feet below the floodplain probably this notion of i mean this is layman's i should probably not say this because i don't really know but um, I, I speculate that we're talking about market value because it's an insurance program. And, they, and they're trying to dissuade you from having repeated claims. Yeah. So was the answer that our repairs this summer aren't necessarily starting? They are. They are. They are starting under the substantial damage clock. I suppose you could call it the substantial improvement with, with the caveat that I need to confirm what repair. I think those two things are the same, but I just want to... Uh, differentiate that substantial improvements are usually things you initiate and substantial damage is something you're reacting to. Do you have any estimate, I was, I was do you have any estimate on the cost of the plan to move the high school to the big cutout? Yes, the south, so, south side uh, of the south, south side. Yeah. <laughs> what was it? It was a uh, 
I don't, um, I don't know. What it's uh, so the the to move the high to build a new high school on the site. Uh, we did get a cost estimate from a professional independent cost estimator. Um, based on the plan that you on, saw, yeah, the plan that you saw plus a, an outline specification, uh, and we are looking at construction in probably two years. And the construction costs were estimated at around seventy-eight million dollars. Uh, and you would need to add probably 20 to 25% for what we call soft costs. Uh, the construction of a building is costs more than just what you pay the contractor because you also have uh, professional fees, architects, engineers, lawyers, permits, uh, moving costs, um, and other logistical costs that uh, come along with a big construction project. Furniture. Furniture, probably. Yeah. Um, is that the high school or high school? High school? Just, the high, just school. the high school. Yeah. Um, and there's some more information in the report in one of the appendixes. Uh, so you can see kind of some of the breakdown there. Um, but yeah, we're, we're in a world of you know, I think Burlington High School is being constructed right now. It's about eight hundred uh, plus dollars a square foot. Uh, they started a, over a year ago. Um, construction cost is escalating in Vermont, uh, about four or five percent per year. Um, it was actually fifteen to twenty percent year over year over the pandemic. Yeah, it's over been, the pandemic. It's been and, much and higher. You're not going to see that go back down. Probably. The professional cost estimators are telling us it's four percent. We're we are observing higher than four percent in Vermont, mostly because. Uh, usually professional cost estimators base their estimates on competitive bidding where you can get three contractors to compete on pretty much every major trade. Uh, we don't have that luxury in Vermont. Sometimes we're lucky to get one bidder. Um, and there are just not enough trades contractors in Vermont to meet the need, so they are charging what they can. Um, so this, costs are higher here. This, this estimate tracks with other estimates we've gotten and tracks with Burlington and Woodstock, different projects that are, you know, either on their way or trying to get started. So um, it's, it, but it, but bear in mind, it's um, we've escalated the cost for two years and every, you know, year that um, which is, which is very ambitious to to say you know construction will start in two years but we just picked that it was just a, a more of a thought exercise um you know often it takes three or four years to get a project going of this scale so um cost escalation we don't know what it's going to be um over the next four years but it will add the, the longer you wait the more it'll cost yeah yeah. No. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I found that. <clears throat> sorry, I found that cost in the appendix, and it looked like all together with the soft costs and the actual construction costs, it was about one hundred and ten million dollars. Um, I'm wondering if that means if we were to then add like a middle school wing does would that be half that much again you were saying there were some cost savings or because they might share some of the expensive parts of the construction yeah we would you know if if that was part of the plan uh, future middle middle school then we would plan the kitchen and cafeteria and um you know all of those core facilities in a way that could be shared you know the ones that could be shared would be shared so there would, there, and you wouldn't have to rebuild uh, more playing fields or anything like that. So it would be substantially less. And it's also, yeah, because of those reasons, you know, sharing building facilities and then sharing site facilities. So it's uh, would be far more economical than, for example, building a middle school on a greenfield site somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And you ended the um, presentation by saying you, I guess recommending that that would be very long term from now, a, a rebuilding a new middle school. Can you give a ballpark number of years you mean when you say long term, very long term from now? Well, 
you know, honestly, it would, it would make, um, it, there, you could make an argument that it would make sense to do it all at once, right? A, a combined middle school, high school, because, um, then you're, you're paying in today's dollars, not in dollars, 10 years from now. Um, but we just thought, you know, the focus was on the high school. That's the critical need. So that's why we were saying the middle school could be future. Um, and as far as the time horizon, that would really be up to the district. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then did you have any other, were there any other land like up at the college or out at the old Elks country club that you looked at and just said, no, that's not the right place for the high school. Or was this really the only location that you considered? Well, because of the walkability factor, the Elks club was ruled out. We did look mm -hmm. at Vermont college. Um, and you know, because recently several of the properties were just sold, um, you know, it was determined that they just weren't, weren't available. Um, but we did look at, um, could you, could you place a high school up, you know, up on the green somewhere? And, um, and the other factor was that it would be separated from the playing fields, which was looked at as unfavorable. Yep. I, I understand that. Okay. I think the high school did fit up at the site, although you'd have to demolish several of the buildings that are there in order to direct it. Um, but then, yeah, you have the, the, the separation of the fields. So that's the kind of, we, we stopped there. Uh, <clears throat> understood. And then you mentioned on the last slide there that we should, one of your recommendations is to do short-term mitigation against flooding at the high school, but I didn't see any, examples of what that would be is some of that already underway yeah absolutely um, and andrew could speak to that but i'll share what i'm aware of which is you know electrical panels that are down in the boiler room have been moved up above the floodplain elevation um the floodplain flood doors uh could be installed in the boiler room and other measures uh, looking at where water made it into the lower level and um you know maybe not rising to the standard of the full FEMA requirements, but taking measures to mitigate, um, sh sh you know, short-term measures to mitigate similar flooding to what we saw in July. So things that wouldn't necessarily keep water out of the building, but might protect critical assets in the building. Yeah. Things that would keep water out under similar flooding conditions to uh, what we experienced in July. So we think oh. you know, there's a bulkhead over near the auditorium where water got in um, there are various pipe penetrations and cracks in the foundation or old holes that could be filled. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned, flood doors, the, um, if you haven't, you should get a tour of the lower levels. It's pretty cavernous. Um, so the water can move through it pretty freely, but the boiler room itself could be protected. So those are all measures that could be done. They, as I mentioned, they don't meet uh, Montpelier's requirements to be substantially uh, impermeable to water up to two feet above the 500 year flood. So as right. floods, floods get higher, um, in those, if those measure, if that, uh, trigger was met, these measures would not uh, address that requirement. Right. Okay. Yep. Um, I just, I also wanted to just share, I can't remember if any other board members managed to make it to the community forums. They were incredibly well facilitated, but not a whole lot of community participation. We didn't have that many of members of our community there. And um, especially because walkability is coming through loud and clear from the folks who were there, I, I would urge us as a board to dig a little bit more deeply into the question of that, because we certainly have a lot of members of our community who can't actually walk to the high school right now or the middle school or the elementary school. And I don't want walkability as a guiding principle to be something that keeps us from making hard decisions we need to make in the future because it you know showed up in the community forums that 
like I said, I'm really glad we held them. And I thought you all did amazing, but I think, you know, we didn't have, we, we should just, I want to vet that as a, a guiding principle a little further before we have to make some hard decisions. Cause right now we're looking at an incredible cost to the community to build a brand new high school in this location. And one that I can't even imagine where the money will come from. And if, if it's, largely rooted in that, I really want us to interrogate that question. It's probably worth noting at this point that it's it's probably worth noting that it's not substantially cheaper to build the same footprint elsewhere in the community. Yep. Um, so yep. that's, you know, that's neither here nor there perhaps, but you know, for what it's worth, we entertained a few other sites like the North Branch Nature Center, um, Sabin's Pasture. We did think about the Elks Club. Interestingly, the Elks Club got ruled out on another project because the developable area wasn't wasn't big enough to include uh, fields and stuff. So if, if we looked at that more seriously here, it might, in, unless, the, unless we're scrapping the golf course, I guess. So... I think there might be a couple percent of the overall budget related to flood mitigation, oh, you know, yeah. new, new fill being brought in to elevate the building. And, but, you know, as you say, everything else is the yeah. same cost wherever it is. Although sites that aren't flat, like some of the ones you mentioned would have additional costs to right. cut and fill and level out uh, an area to have a, yeah. a school, a parking and fields. It won't be half as much. It, it, you know, we uh, recently, um, we've been working with the Milton school district and, um, they have, we've been working at the Herrick Avenue school, which is a large elementary school and middle school for 1100 students. And we did two schemes. One was a renovation project, um, with where we demolished part of the building and, um, did an addition and renovated, you know, a good portion of the building. And then the other was a, a brand new build and the brand new build was 6% more. And the school board at the time was sort of like, this is a no brainer. Why would we work on our old car and spend 94% and we could spend 6% more and get a new car and get a new building, get a year faster. And one of the things about, these gnarly renovation projects. Cause we, we went through this when we did the Winooski project is it's absolutely um, a nightmare for the students and the educators who work in the building because they're working in, you know, what feels like a war zone They're you know, it's noisy, there's disruption, they're having to relocate their classes. Um, and when you build, you know, one really, important feature not to i think be overlooked is when you do build new you you avoid that um and when it's done kids can move over and um and and educators as well so um and the cost difference as i said is not um you know i, I think if we were to do a complete full-bodied renovation of the high school and flood proofed it we probably would be getting at numbers um I'm not saying they'd be the same, but they wouldn't be substantially different from new construction. Just, uh, uh, going back to the, the U32 option, I just want to kind of get a sense of how deeply you went into it. So, so my understanding is U32 would have the capacity to take Montpelier High School students plus their current configuration, correct? So about Pillar High School students plus the current seven through 12 of... It, it appears so from, and this was a very, uh, we were given floor plans from U32 and they had done the capacity calculation and they had said, here's all the classrooms and, and they just, divided by 30 and we use those numbers. So it would require a much more in depth um, analysis to, to really confirm, but initially, yes, that's what we're saying. And then there were a variety of other problems, which I think we're all kind of aware of having to do with 
yeah. the configuration and the, the configuration yeah. of the two districts all and, and obviously to that for that to happen there would have to be some sort of merger and we'd have to work those out anyways um yeah the answer is probably no but did you look at all i mean because because u32 is not walkable from montpelier but it arguably is bikeable and there's a fairly good bike path system which could be improved obviously probably not for february but certainly for for now um did you look at possibilities of that at all just in terms of of making kind of non-car access to some remote places a little easier um we did not Suppose we were to abandon the high school site. Um, would it have value to some other entity? Um, and what do you think they would do with it? Being in a 500 year floodplain or 100 year yeah. floodplain? It's zoned for school only, I believe. Um, the, I'm, it's not a, sure, it's I'm not a, sure that. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think I looked at the zoning map and it's a unique uh, zoning classification, which could probably be adjusted. but. Yeah, it's in the floodplain. So anyone who bought the property would have to also comply with the same requirements. So they'd have a, a high bar to to move in. Mm -hmm. It's hard to imagine what I mean, it's got a lot of value as it is right now for the school, it just continuing in use. Um so it's probably more valuable to the district as, as the asset that it is and being a large parcel in town that could be used in the future like there's a path forward uh than it would be to others i'm i'm speculating but the but main street's a different story main just, street yeah, is not zoned we, for we were we were wondering about the use of main street middle school as housing because um we've seen many schools uh, retrofitted, rehabbed for housing, and they, it's a pretty good fit. Um, it's, you know, the parking, the, the, obviously there's a dire need for housing everywhere in Vermont. And so we think that would be, you know, if, if you were to, um, that would probably attract developers for that use. I don't know that the high school, um, site, I, I, I It'd be an interesting conversation with with people who do that kind of development. Like, you know, would it what what kind of value would it have, and for what use? I don't know. And is it the property of the district or the property of the city? The, the high school site district. Okay. And the middle school. Mm -hmm. What are the risks of doing nothing? Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, does that does that trigger anything other than a big, bigger, more expensive cleanup, well, or do we get to a point where we're going to be forced out of that building? Well, I think the probably the biggest risk is you have the flood, you have another flood, and it doesn't happen in July, and it happens during the school year, and you don't have a school. There's no downtown for, Macy's. And there's no downtown Macy's. Yeah. So I think the biggest risk is you, you won't, you don't have a school you can use for months and months and you have to figure out what to do. I mean, is there, is there a point kind of given where the regulations are, where it could be say it, it's hit by two or three floods quickly, where it just could be too expensive from an insurance or regulatory standpoint to go back in. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, there is this provision of substantial damage, and it's 50% of the fair value. I, I have a little bit of a difficult time seeing, you know, a, a regulatory body enforcing that, but it's there. And I think the the stick is if it's not enforced, the municipality could risk losing its flood insurance um, through the NFIP. And then so if it is triggered, then the question is what's involved in doing this flood proofing and that's we talked a little bit about how hard it is to quantify that and the impact it would have on the school but it's the elevation just for reference is i think three and a half feet 43 inches above the existing floor so the everything below the floor that 
subgrade space we talked about, the boiler room. And then as you start to go up, you have challenges because the higher the water you're designing against, the more the hydrostatic pressure exerts, not just on the walls, but on the slab that's designed not for uplift, but for down uh, loads. So, you know, it's certainly many millions of dollars. I don't know how many. Um, and then there's the disruption factor that, that David planned. I think what I would be worried about is one, the unplanned um, impact to being able to hold school in a flooding event, and then two, the unplanned reaction to it if there hasn't been at least a plan in place um, to have to either repair, repair and or change directions rapidly without a plan. Just to put a little flesh on the bones for the for the board in evaluating, you know, what we what we wanted to do was try and quantify the cost of dry flood proofing the school. And as we got into it, as we did, got the final determination of what the elevation of flood proofing would have to be, we realized it's a very complicated project because the flood proofing elevation is actually above the bottom of the window openings. Um, it also includes mechanical equipment called unit ventilators, which are in several spaces, which have openings below the windowsill. So it's, it's not just the building envelope being flood proofed into an inverse bathtub. It's also a ventilation project. It's taking the brick off the entire building. It's reinforcing the backup wall, which is built of concrete blocks every four feet with rebar and grout. Um, it's, uh, it's a real. It's it affects not just the windows, but the ribbon window infill. That building was originally a mid-century. Uh, I won't call it a masterpiece, but it was a mid-century exemplar, uh, and it had ribbon full ribbon windows, um, and it was it, those ribbon windows were infilled. So the flood proofing would impact the bottom of that opening as well. So it's we we came to the realization that this is really a, a different a separate project. Um, and it's very complicated and it seems like it is going to be a lot of money just uh, without going into get you know, doing drawings and details and getting a, a cost estimate for that particular scope of work to try and put our arms around it. We, we know that it's definitely in the millions, um, and it's, and it's time consuming. No such thing as a light fair meeting anymore. I know. Yeah. I'm so okay. sorry. It's no right. hanging fruit topics anymore. Um, so I'm curious, you know, there's obviously a lot of sticker shock. There's like a lot of doom in mm -hmm. this conversation on the wake of really hard conversations. Um, and I'm also reflecting on, <clears throat> you know, schools that I've taught in that have been next to super fun sites or the school that I grew up going to, which was located next to a swamp. And when I think about the, you know, the historical locating of schools over time, they are oftentimes cited in really uh, inopportune, sometimes high risk uh, areas. So I'm curious with all of this information, it sounds like this is not the only district you're working with. Um, you know, is there, or do any of us know if there is a, an impetus to look at this at like a state level? Um, so that we can be proactive <laughs> in planning. Um, <laughs> you can't pass the mic, David. So yeah, so, because fine. this is like really alarming. This is like a really jarring yeah. dollar value that I can't imagine us absorbing. And the fact that like this fire could now be going off in terms of like this alarm, alarmed crisis, high anxiety yeah. feeling for lots of different school districts. It seems like we must be talking with each other regionally on a statewide basis. And I'm just curious, like how aware the state is of the conversations happening. Um, I'm curious about the, the initiative around the state, um, the construction you know, aid program. It would be great to think that these things were the result of planning and response to knowledge and information. So I'm just, if you can fill in any of those those blanks, because it feels like we really need collaboration and we really need information. We're a small state with a limited tax base and this feels really big. That's very well said. And um, I can I can offer, uh, I was on the uh, state task force for the school construction aid and I can offer what I understand. Um, 
the the state understands that there, there's a huge problem. It's across the state. It's not just Montpelier. You know, the kind of numbers we're talking about, it's a little different here because you have this, uh, the, the flooding issue and the, the trigger of the 50%. So you might, you know, you have to, uh, you have a, a, a s extra factors, but every school district is dealing with these same issues of, um, facility needs that far outstrip their ability to budget, um, aging facilities, facilities that are not aligned with education and, um, and the total for the state was six to $7 billion of needs, facility needs. And that and, was conservative. And that's conservative. And that's yeah. That was, without yeah, that was without changing them to align them with, with the educational program. And so one of the realizations and recommendations in the task force from the task force was that, you know, we've got this really big problem. We have limited resources. We're not going to be able to fund every school project. And one of the, the bill that's in the, um, I think it's in the Senate right now is H871 is a bill to start a planning grant program for um, districts and supervisory unions to start developing facilities master plans. So to start kind of, kind of get their arms around what, what's your plan? How are you going to attack this? How are you going to address this? Um, and that is being considered as one of the eligibility requirements to get into the school construction aid program. So all this work you're doing is um, right on track. Uh, I should say also that, you know, one of the recommendations is that school districts budget to, to take care of their buildings um, in a responsible way. And right now the APPA regu uh, guidelines are, you know, the, the only thing the state really has been using as a, a guideline as to what's reasonable. So another eligibility requirement could be that um, a district is on a path at least towards adequately funding their capital budgets, because I think one thing the state's concerned about is, you know, providing aid, construction aid to districts and then not having the assets maintained. So, so everything we're talking about is consistent with the, the task force recommendations and H871. Um, there's a somewhat of a reluctance to of the state to come up with a master plan for the whole state or for um, to, you know, they're really, the, the, the approach is carrots and not sticks, right? To provide incentives to, to uh, influence behavior in a way that's consistent with state policy, but not penalize districts. Um, you know, just basically use use carrots, money as carrots to get, you know, um, the behaviors that. But you know, there's no um, state master plan for facilities. There's no big picture thinking, and in, um, in that regard, there are you know there are different acts that have been. Um, enacted over the years. And so it's kind of a patchwork quilt of state goals. I do want to be mindful that we're at uh, almost at 25. Um, yeah, quick question. Why do we have to put people last? Because I know this is going to be a, a conversation. Oh, do you have more questions, Maya? I have a question. Go, go ahead. Go ahead, Lynn. Um, I'm curious, um, I know if we have a new building, it will be much more energy efficient than what we're dealing with now. And I'm, I'm wondering um, if you have any sense of what kind of savings that might provide for us in terms of um, the cost in, uh, of paying for a new building? Not at this time, we don't know. Okay, there's not like any general idea that you save 20% on energy if you get your building up to standards or whatever. 
Well, I mean, we would, we would, at this point, you know, our, our goal with, oh, our goal with every project is to design net zero energy building. So, um, the goal would be to have it consume no energy or to produce as much energy as it consumes over the course of a year, which I don't know what you're paying now, but that should be a substantial savings. And then um, the only other comment I want to make in terms of U32 is I, I know you did a study for them too. And I guess what we need to find out is what condition their building is in, right? Like what would, if we talked about combining, what would that mean in terms of additional when this expenses? company, Truex Collins didn't do U32 study. They're working with, oh. a, with a different group and I don't know if they're actual architects. I think they're a different type of group. Okay. But I guess that would be a question we need to find out too, right? Like what, what would need to happen there yeah, in terms of. There are many questions that would need to be found out through a merger committee. Yeah. yeah. I, I think they have done a, a overall facilities review. Um, capacity review. Capacity review. Uh, and they're, I think, grappling with perhaps even more difficult issues that we have grappled with. So. But there would be a lot to talk about, but I think it's a conversation um, worth having. Uh, Jill. Jill. I'll be quick um, because my fellow board members asked some really good questions like about the, I'm curious about the windows still and the PCB piece. Um, I've been really looking forward to this for a really long time. I'm really excited about it. My affect is a little low because we're a little heartbroken after what we've gone through with what's happening with this building. So I apologize. It's nothing to do with your presentation. I just really wanted to thank you for providing us um, an objective and clear and realistic accounting of what we have um, because that's how we're going to be able to make these smart decisions and try really hard to take the emotion out. Um, I also feel a little vindicated because the middle school has always been something I've been very curious to hear what folks such as yourself would say. Um, I live next to the middle school or pretty close to it. And I have my kid has gone through union and the middle school and now she's at the high school. So I've spent a lot of time in all those buildings. Um, so I, I really want to encourage our community to really think about what we want for our kids and what's going to work to, you know, consolidate our resources. And I do think that um, moving the middle school to the high school and having our high schoolers go to U32 or combining the buildings, just like you said, makes a lot of sense. I really think we need to start to think about that. Um, one of the things we've wrestled with with our budget lately is we also don't want to be so draconian that um, the few houses that people might be able to find for sale in Montpelier are not, are not um, folks who would send their kids to the school. So we need to think really long-term and big picture. Um, and then just lastly, I feel like I'd re be remiss if I didn't put in a plug. I think you guys are also working with the Central Vermont Career Center. And I was the board's representative on that because we're part of their independent district. Um, and, and they're looking for space too. So I, I, I love the idea of like our communities, like us and Washington Central and Central Vermont Career Center, like, all right, like, we've got limited space and no money. Is there anything we can do since we're all trying to make changes at the same time? Um, so I'm, I'll take that on for sure. Um, but I just really wanted to, um, after the really challenging few months we've had, it's really incredibly helpful for us to make decisions that are not emotion-based, but are just fact-based. Like you gave us the facts, like them or not, these are the facts. And also I found your visuals really helpful. Um, and I, and lastly, I just say, I think, um, having, you know, been in Montpelier during the flood, I can't think of anything that would be better to be in a floodplain than fields. It's that or parking lots, which we have plenty of those. So I actually don't have concerns about that. It seems like a very reasonable, um, accounting and, um, my day job is I work in property tax. And so I do think that while our middle school is not great for the staff, it's not great for students. It's pretty awful for the exterior as far as what the kids have for, you know, a playground um, and the busing and walking in the morning is really dangerous, but for um, apartments or condominiums or something, it's a walkable flat place really close to downtown Montpelier. And I do think it would be really valuable for that. So um, just thank you again. And sorry, I guess that wasn't short, but that's all. Thank you, Jill. Um,
Uh, what, what exactly was our flood? Was it a hundred year flood or a five or like a 200 year flood or somewhere in between? 250, 300? Yeah. <laughs> I was just trying to worry. It was a 12 year flood because we had one years ago. Um, it was at roughly elevation 524 to 524.5. And the 100 year flood is 523.8. So it was. So it was so almost cool. nine inches above the 100 year. How high is the 500? 500 year is 525.42. Yeah, I remember. And so you add okay. two feet on that to get to the protected. Okay. Which is which, which is very close to the actual floor elevation of my, of the high school, right? The, yeah, it's about three inches. It's about above, three inches. Three so inches just above, yeah. ways of thinking about it is that, that the floor level is roughly the 500 year. Below. When you, look at, when you look at the maps, it's not a much larger area when you get to 500, because I think... Well, my goes... Yeah, 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 right, yeah. exactly. So, yeah. and the, the flood filled up all the flat parts of the city where all the development is. Is the 500, 100 uh, map the, being changed, or has it been changed recently? I think it's in, you know, wherever FEMA... <laughs> headquarters makes their decisions. They're in the process specifically for Montpelier and Barry. My recollection uh, is several years ago, FEMA updated it. And actually I think it was Barry uh, peeled the process and it took a lot longer than it normally, well, it always takes long, but it took even longer. Um, and so it has been updated, you know, within the last 10 years. So it will be a while before we get through its normal cycle. But what I understand in committees, uh, FEMA is looking at its entire process and based on the frequency of rain events and flooding, looking at redesignating uh, either the elevations or the elevations to which protection must be made. I, I don't know the answer exactly at me. Most buildings need to be protected to the 100 year. The reason we talked about 500 year here is because it's a critical facility. I think what may be happening is FEMA is looking at all buildings needing to be protected to the five. Yeah, I know, know FEMA is doing a, a big, big redo. And um, I think that most of what's mapped as 500 years with climate change is more like the weather in Europe, right? Weather um, in reality. Well, this, this conversation um, reminds me of the conversation we had with Jeff the high school does flood again, not in July or in a way that takes a while to fix. Um, I don't want the kids to go to re remote. I don't want them to go to Berlin Mall. So you know, enough to put something together. They can't go remote. So that's not an option with the Agency of Education. And uh, they very well may go to the Berlin Mall <laughs> because there's not many other options for us to get them there, get them anywhere. I mean, U32 has capacity, but yeah. It's sort of, you know, uh, just I mean, putting something together with them. You to didn't that. make it be known that they might be a, that they might have been available for a start of last school year. So that yeah, like, so formalize that a little bit. Yeah. Like, what would that look like to bring our students up there, and where would they actually have their classes? You know, I I don't you know I just I think it I think it's would be dumb to not prepare for that. I also have to prepare for the longer term stuff. So we really appreciate your input. Yeah, no, this this has been fantastic. Um, really excellent report. Uh, as informative as it is sobering. Um, kind of what I expected, but um, it's it's really good to have these facts out there because there's a lot of a lot of a lot of talking in the community and, and not all of it is, is as informed as it will be with with this report. And that's one of the reasons we did it. Um, and it, I think opens our eyes to, to kind of where we need to be looking in the future. So really, really appreciate it. It's a discussion we are going to continue to have, I think pretty pretty robustly because um, we did have a narrow miss in July. Um, and, um, you know, as Jake just alluded to, um, you know, a few more inches of water at a different time of year and we'd be in a very different situation. Can I ask a couple of questions? Now we're we're done with public comments, but you're definitely willing to you know email us you or about this that we're talking about. Yeah, I know, but it's not a it's not an open public discussion, but I 
Yeah. Well, you do Appreciate realize that the, that the 27 flood was in November? Yeah. That, November that, 3rd. Yeah, no, we, we know that, you know, and there was the 91 flood in Montpelier that was, I think, in... No, it was a little later. It was, it was during the spring melt. It was, I think, March. Yeah. No, it's, yeah. No, we, we, Irene was August. Irene was, yeah. Irene was. I do have a question about your, your blocks of color over here. You said there's something wrong with this arena, this auditorium. I'd like to know what that is. Dave, I'm happy to take your question yeah. and then, like, after the meeting, or you I could link yeah. up with you this week, and then I could get it to you to these folks. That, do you have a copy of that block with the colors? I, I, we can get a paper copy for sure. Yeah, yeah, we, we can get a copy of the report to you. Yeah, no, we can get you a copy of the report, and then if you have any questions, you can, you know, Chris and Arette can, yep, um, can answer it or mm -hmm. get an answer. Yep. All right, thanks, Dave. Thanks, guys. Go forward. Point of view yeah. would this be something the facilities commission committee would now sort of? Yeah, and I, I think we, I, I think we want to digest this and discuss this again. Um, you know, we have uh, you know, Libby and I had a discussion with Megan Roy, uh, who's the superintendent of the Wash Central District, and. Uh, for Dia Smith, who's the board chair, uh, with a promise to start that conversation in spring. I have been they won't be ready for it. I, I said I've been waiting. They have not passed their budget yet. Um, I have been waiting for them to get through that before I reach out because I know they they have a lot of hard decisions as well, including um, potential multiple school closings, which the, I don't think they're planning on voting for until next fall. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I want to, I think we need to probably start the discussion before, or at least reach out before next fall. Um, but, um, we want to follow that up too, uh, and kind of get board input on that because, you know, if, uh, if you look at the figures, you know, a, a possible merger definitely has some upsides, uh, costs being one of them and it's you know it's a constructed high school in a location that's on the edge of montpelier um you know costs both in terms of avoiding having to build a new high school or, or deal with you know extreme damage to the current one um and also you know as our both our districts get smaller and the state puts additional pressures on us it, there may be cost savings and, and educational gains so big big conversation there uh, those are kind of the two things, but we will definitely keep this on the agenda and, and keep it with the facilities committee. Um, and and my, my thought is to have kind of a check in, you know, in a, in a you know, a couple months or so when we've had time to digest, get some feedback from the community, um, and maybe have an update on on where the conversation with with uh, Wash Central is. Um, <laughs> Oh, we have one more agenda item. Before. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, we have one more agenda item, uh, and that's the policy monitoring reports, um, which is uh, C29, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and F2, non-discriminatory mascot and school branding. Uh, do I have a motion to approve those two? Uh, it's not it's called the facility or policy monitoring report. They're not facility monitoring. Okay. They're policy, policy monitoring. monitoring reports, yes. <laughs> They're monitoring facilities. Now, yes. Uh, facilities on the mind. Um, do you have a motion to approve those two policy monitoring reports? I need to accept the policy monitoring reports. Um, do you have a second? Second. Any discussion or questions? See any online? Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, motion to adjourn. I'm going to make we it. Adjourn? <laughs> <laughs> Can I make a comment? Yeah. Before we do, um, with respect to the budget passing yesterday and the vote that the board made a couple weeks ago to send LRB students from Roxbury to Montpelier. Um, there's going, there are going to be 
you know, there are going to continue to be a lot of strong emotions for, for quite some time. And I just want, um, I just want to observe that, um, in my experience, and I'm not sure exactly who I'm talking to, but in my experience, people often take some solace in finding blame or, or assigning blame. And in my experience, in reality, reality is far more complex than that. You know, in this community, there are a number of, of, of folks who are essentially aging in place because they don't have another option. And when you're aging in place because you don't have another option, your residence is unlikely to produce children. And then when, you, when you don't have residences that produce children, it can become challenging to have a school. Um, and, I, and I just, I hope that, that folks in this community can kind of um, begin the process of healing. And I hope that our board and Montpelier can recognize that that process of healing is going to take a lot more than a couple months or even really a year. It might take many years. Um, and that we should not take for granted that school starts in September and that healing is over. I think it's going to take a long time. And um, I think it's, it's going to take intentional and compassionate, um, you know, work on the part of, of the board and the administration and, um, and I want to put that work in, and I hope that our Montpelier residents recognize that 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 process is going to take quite a bit of time, um, and that people will afford Roxbury community community members the time that is necessary to go through that process of healing, um, and hopefully, you know, all the talk of closure is premature because the building contains continues to be a resource of the district and until there's a decision otherwise that's the reality that we're sitting in um and and you know there are opportunities and um we just need to find them and 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 i just just want to say that yeah no, I, I really appreciate that right and, and i also want to i mean i think I, I agree i think the board has to be super intentional about for the next you know several years and i think throughout of making sure that we really respect this as two communities. And, and there's also a hope that that when Roxbury students do go to UES, there might be the opportunity for attachments between the two communities that you know may not be happening now. I mean, elementary school, I think having all the, the students start at one as an elementary school is a, is a great opportunity for you know friendships to development since kindergarten, because it can be tough to come in in fifth or sixth grade to a group that's already very established. Um, and same with parents too. I mean, there's a lot more parent connection at the elementary school level than there is when you get to middle school and high school and the students kind of become their own independent units. And, and I'm hoping that there's you know some, some friendship and some kind of cross community um, cultivation of relationships that, that happen because you know parents of younger kids oftentimes tend to to make friendships and to be more involved and to be more at, you know, the, the soccer practices and the plays. So um, a lot of, a lot of hurt and a lot of need for healing. And, and I think some opportunities for healing and, you know, change, change is hard, but, but change also oftentimes produces um, some unexpected things and some of those unexpected things can be wonderful. Um, all in favor of adjourning? Did we get a motion? I made a motion. I don't know if there was a second. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Okay. Uh, okay.